Education Council. And we're so happy to have you join us for our first event of 2021 to celebrate Women's History Month. To kick off this event, I wanted to open the floor up first to Mary Cooper. Um, she's this year's chair for the Countywide Women's Leadership Council. Um, but first, I wanna say a few words about Mary as background before she gets started. So Mary is the mother of four boys and six grandchildren. She attended college for her undergrad and graduate program at High Point University. She's had a long career with RJ Reynolds for 22 years, holding various positions in her tenure, which she is currently chair of the Women's Leadership Council, and she is also serving on the board of United Way of Forsyth County. She's been a member of WLC for six years, and she also volunteers with uh, uh, Boys and Girls Club as well. So Mary, uh, will you give us a nice warm welcome? Hi, everyone. I'm having technical difficulties over here. <laughs> um, sorry about my camera. I can't seem to get that off either. Oh, there it went. Ta-da! Hey! Well, I just want to say welcome, everyone. Uh, I think this is going to be a great event, and I hope that everyone gets something out of this event today. So there again, welcome, and I thank you for being on. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I know we're excited to get started with our panel discussion, uh, but I wanted to quickly go over uh, what WLC is uh, so that our newcomers can learn a little bit about how we got started, what we are, and then if you guys need a refresher, you'll also hear that as well. Um, so the Women's Leadership Council is an affinity group through the, through the United Way. It is its own organization with an executive committee, subcommittee, and bylaws for governments. The Women's Leadership Council was established in 2007 with 12 founding members as an organization that promoted philanthropic leaders in Winston-Salem and Forsyth County. One of the main focuses of Women's Leadership Council has been to help accelerate high school graduation rates in Forsyth County. We are dedicating ourselves even more this year by expanding uh, access to women in philanthropy, creating engaging volunteer opportunities and meaningful events like today to inspire and empower women in Forsyth County. Um, so that's just a little snippet about the Women's Leadership Council. I wanna thank Mary for her leadership uh, being the chair. Uh, she's already made great strides to improving Women's Leadership Council by re recruiting three full committees, our steering committee, membership and communication committee who have all helped plan this event. And we wanna thank each and every one of you for your hard work and time that you put into planning this event. Uh, so without further ado, um, it is time for our panel discussion. Uh, our host, Borgia Walker, will be our moderator for today. She's the Vice President of Talent for Effectiveness Inclusion for Reynolds American. She has been a member of the HR leadership team at Reynolds since 2017 and has been with Reynolds for 26 years. She has had roles in a number of functions, including finance, internal audit, regulatory oversight, and HR. A native of Louisville, Kentucky, Borgia holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in accounting from the University of Louisville and a master's degree in business administration from Webster University and is a certified public accountant in Kentucky. Borgia is passionate about giving back to the community. She is currently a member of the board of directors for a legacy federal credit union and the YWCA. She has been a WLC member since its inception and has served as the chair for Reynolds United Way campaign in 2020 an outstanding year. She loves to travel with her husband, Ben, and their 11-year-old son, Austin, when they are on baseball fields. So Borgia, take it away. Thank you, Brittany. And welcome to all who have joined us today. I'm so excited to host the panel. Um, so I wanna get to the heart of the agenda. What a great way to round out Women's History Month. Um, we have fantastic panelists joining us today. And without further ado, I'd love to introduce those panelists now. First, I'd like to welcome Joy Nelson Thomas. She's the founder of LEAD, 
learning every day, accomplishing dreams. Lead girls of North Carolina. Between the ages of eight and 14, the confidence level of girls falls 30%. Girls without clear career goals are easy targets for early pregnancy. A high school dropout is ineligible for 90% of jobs in America. Joy is committed to creating a world where every girl has the confidence, social skills, and leadership ability she needs to become an independent, financially stable woman. A Salem College graduate, Joy herself experienced adversity growing up. A first-generation American, she was bullied in elementary and middle school. She supported herself through college and paid for her own apartment. And as an adult, she left a lucrative job as a design manager for PPG to be a founder of League Girls, one of the hardest career choices she could make. She's been recognized by the Women's Fund of Winston-Salem for her extraordinary vision, chosen by Yes Weekly Magazine as Wonder Woman of the Triad in 2018, the ABWA Woman of the Year and nominated by the Chronicle newspaper as Organization of the Year in 2019. She recently just was recognized by Forsyth Women's Magazine and Joyce speaks to Rotary Clubs, Service Clubs and Leadership Groups and would love your referrals as a speaker. She's a certified life coach and Joy believes in being the change we need for our community. So welcome Joy. Next, I'd like to introduce India Beal. India is a North Carolina based artist, educator and author. Beal's work merges fine arts with social justice. She uses photography and video to reveal the often overlooked and unappreciated experiences unique to people of color. Beale's first monograph, Performance Review, brings together work over a 10-year period that highlights the realities and challenges for women of color in the corporate workplace. Her workshops and keynotes often offer an innovative, engaging, and relatable approach to team building and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Beale's two-hour sessions are designed around the fundamental idea that diversity enhances creativity and innovation. Beale is featured in several online editorials, including the New York Times, NBC, BET, Huffington Post, and National Geographic. And she's also appeared in Time Magazine, the Financial Times Weekend Magazine, Vice Magazine, Essence, Marie Claire, and Newsweek. Her work has been exhibited in several institutions and museums. She's a fellow of the Center for Curatorial Leadership and completed residencies at Harvard Art Museum, the Center for Photography at Woodstock and McCall Center and Art for Art and Innovation. And Beale holds a dual BFA AH in art history and studio art from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and an MFA from Yale University. So welcome India. Thank you. Last but not least is Claire Calvin. Claire was born and raised in Houston, Texas but has lived all over the country before moving to Winston-Salem 12 years ago with her husband, Dr. Matt Giegengag, who took a job in the ophthalmology department at Wake Forest Hospital. Claire and Matt live in the West End with their three children, Finn, 16, Gus, 13, and Ruby, 10. A lawyer by training, Claire took time off from her career to start a family. In 2010, after adopting their daughter, Ruby, from Ethiopia, she began to imagine a new career that would combine her love for cooking, community, and Tex-Mex food, my favorite also. She started a small family meal delivery service called Dinners on the Porch. The business took orders via the internet and delivered meals all over Winston-Salem on most Tuesday nights. As the business grew rapidly through word of mouth, she ultimately realized that a larger facility would help her business grow sustainably. In January of 2014, the porch opened its door with the goal of serving more delivery customers as well as customers who might like to come sit and enjoy tacos and margaritas with friends and family. The porch has become a destination for Tex-Mex lovers in Winston-Salem and beyond, and its success made it possible to expand to new ventures such as Alma Mexicana, in January of 18 and Canteen Market Bistro in September of 18. Keeping the businesses centrally located and creating a diverse, lively atmosphere is one of Claire's key objectives. During the crisis, Calvin and her restaurant teams have leaned heavily on the original business model of meal delivery, which has helped the business navigate the uncertainties of the pandemic. 
They're looking forward to growth and new challenges in the coming years. And the porch is definitely one of my family's favorite restaurants in Winston. So welcome, Claire. So as you can see, we have fantastic panelists and I can't wait to dive in and start asking you guys some questions. So the first question I'm gonna ask kind of goes to all of you to answer. Um, what is leadership? Uh, what does it mean to you? And what is your leadership style? Claire, if you would go first and then we'll follow your answer with India and Joy. Um, well, I think that I would say that as a ment well, I think in my business and my specifically the restaurant business, um, there's so many young people that, you know, end up coming in and going out. So you have a lot of people that maybe aren't, they're not, I'm not training people to be chefs necessarily, but I'm hoping that in the couple of years that they're with us or six months or whatever, um, that we can give them some skills and confidence to be able to, um, you know, either enhance our business or take with them in the rest of their life. Um, and a lot of times I think that is hard. Like I, I will ask of people more than they think they're capable of. Um, and so I just, the other day had a person who was like, who said, I need to step down from this position. I don't think I can do it. You know, I'm, I made so many mistakes. And so it sounds kind of counterintuitive, I guess, but I try to, um, I try to be pretty transparent about um, my mistakes and the places where I'm still growing, which is a lot of places um, and not necessarily to like lead with failure, but, <laughs> um, but you know, to try to talk about where I've been in terms of leadership, which is not necessarily like saying, I'm gonna be in charge of all this, um, but growing sometimes painfully um, into that position. So I think for me, um, you know, trying to just not let what hasn't worked or what I have failed at dictate what I think I'm capable of um, in the future and, and then try to encourage other people to take those same kind of risks. Yes, I think being vulnerable definitely uh, helps people have hope that they can do things they didn't think they could achieve as well. So I totally uh, agree with you. Uh, India, what would you add to that? Definitely. First and foremost, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be a part of the conversation, especially during Women's History Month uh, with these amazing women, Claire and Joy. So, and I also love uh, the porch. So Aww, thank you so thank much. You. It's really <laughs> wonderful to kind of see you on screen as well. Um, in terms of just leadership, uh, I'm a strong believer, especially as an artist, innovator, that it's important for us to create opportunities to create work for me as an artist that is greater than myself right? Um, the idea as a leader that I'm serving a greater purpose, uh, something that can create real change, real opportunities, um, whether it's in photography, whether it's in diversity, equity, and inclusion. I had an R on the end, so diversity, equity, inclusion, and relationships. But more importantly, serving something that can create kind of a, a, a global uh, footprint. Uh, for me, as a leader, I'm always looking for other leaders that I can see myself in. So I was a professor for several years, and it was important for me to see myself in leadership, whether that was the vision of the organization, the moral compass, which I think is so important right now for an organization, uh, the vision and the ways in which they're thinking about moving forward. And so I think for many uh, individuals, including myself, it's important to see myself in leadership, whether that's from a cultural gender perspective as a Black woman, um, but also um, you know, thinking about my own uh, ideas and thoughts and are those being appreciated and listened to and um, in many ways, I guess, uh, supported within an organization. So if I had to think about leadership in that sense, I would say that being able to see yourself in an organization, most importantly, realizing as a leader, we're serving something greater than ourselves. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. And Joy, what would you have for your um, leadership style? What are your thoughts? Uh, kind of piggyback um, off uh, Dia, um, I believe a lot in collaborative impact. Um, and I believe that being a leader is be building a consensus around one big purpose or one big mission. And I believe that 
um, especially for my team, we all have a voice and we all play a part. So it's just like a football team. Everybody is playing a position and you need all of those positions to really uh, to make a good team and to win the Super Bowl. And so um, I think it's just really important that my my staff and as a leader that people have a voice. Um, and especially women, uh, because my team is all women. Um, I just think it's so important that they have a voice and they know that their opinions and their um, and their expertise, you know, I brought them because I knew they, they brought something to the table and that they can use that without feeling like, oh, you know, I can't share my expertise or I'm just doing this one job. I think that's just so important that people have a voice in and that we're working towards one purpose together. Um, and I like to coach. I think we all, um, as Adia said, I think we all seek out leaders that we see ourselves in um, or that we want to aspire to be. And I think um, that's just so important um, that you be willing to share um, your expertise and, 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 and coach, even coach um, the individuals that are around you. That's awesome. Joy, I'm going to stay with you as a follow up. How, how have you seen your leadership um, style have to change over your career? Uh, that's a good question. I would say um, coming from a male dominated industry, um, I had to change a lot. I, I think the biggest change was um, not being so uh, like, this is the way it is um, to really being really flexible. Um, and I think that's just really important um, as a leader to show up and to, to be flexible and to know that you don't have always all the answers as Claire had, had stated a little bit earlier. So I would say um, definitely um, the flexibility is a, is a big one for me. Claire, how about you? Have you had to change your style throughout your career? Um, well, certainly, I mean, I think my previous career iterations of my life. I was a teacher for a couple of years and then um, practiced law for several years. And I was not, I, I was not a leader in those, in those environments because I was sort of a junior person um, in both those places. So it really, I didn't have any kind of leadership, you know, as an adult, have any kind of leadership experience until I started um, my own business which made it hard. I didn't really see myself as a leader until I realized that our business didn't really have a leader. <laughs> and then I was like, wait, I am the leader. <laughs> <laughs> so I think for a long time I was, and I still do this. I find myself doing this. I really tend to kind of try to gather consensus to a fault. You know, I'll, I'll, I want to go around to so many different people and say, oh, we could try this or this or this. And so I have to make myself be like, this is what's going to happen. So I, you know, I, and my, it's even in my, my husband will say, well, why do you ask me questions? You know, what's in your head, you have the vision, but it's like, I don't want to just say, we're going to do this. This is my vision. Here's what we're going to do. Um, so sometimes I have to really work on if I know what my vision is, just telling people that this is what this is how this is going to go. Um, so I would say that's sometimes hard. I mean, I think it's harder for women, maybe um, especially in corporate environments, because you don't want to go so far out on a limb. Um, and so I think just just getting a little bit better at at taking the risk of saying, this is what I think we should do. Let's do it. And, and watching people follow you instead of like what I tend to do, which is to kind of say, well, is, that, is are we all doing this together? You know? Um, so I've had to, I've had to work on that quite a bit just to kind of be more authoritative in the, in the moment when it, when it needs to happen. Very good. India, what about you? How has your style changed or have to change with your oh. career? Yeah, it's, it's changed dramatically. I mean, you know, a lot of my work focuses on the unseen and the unheard. And so when you're focusing on a demographic or a group that is, is not in power, the question is how do you get people in power 
to understand and to hear. I'm a big music lover and Erica Badu, who's one of my favorite artists, she says, what good do your words do if I can't understand you, right? So like, I had to make sure that the people who I was, you know, the audience, I really needed to hear which were individuals in power that they understood where I was coming from, right? But they had to be able to relate to the experiences that are usually foreign to them. And so for me, um, it really had me making my leadership style much more fluid. Um, it couldn't be stagnant because I was focusing on a group, like I said, that's unseen and unheard and trying to get individuals in power to understand and relate. And so um, it is ever evolving, uh, ever changing. Um, for myself, I'm learning a lot in the process. Um, you know, a friend of mine says you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And I think for me as a leader, that's enjoy shaking her head because I think all of us have been in that position before, you know, and I think that's one of the big things in my leadership growth, I would say, is being able to kind of evolve in that space um, as well. Wow, what great insights you ladies are having, you're bringing it tonight. This is awesome. Um, I'm going to stay with you, India, for a minute and ask you, what do you think is the most significant barrier to female leadership? Uh, well, um, I don't believe in barriers, even though they may exist. I would say that, I mean, you know, even for photography, which is a white male dominated industry, um, that uh, many times is creating the platforms that other women can have opportunities to have a voice. And so for me, I think that it's just creating more growth in terms of opportunities. There's a lot of really wonderful organizations um, moving forward have really kind of, you know, push that glass ceiling aside and really created opportunities for women, for people of color. But I would say one of the major um, challenges is creating more platforms, more opportunities to put these individuals in leadership positions so that their voice is always heard, not just like during Women's History Month, you know, but continuously having those types of conversations, yeah. Awesome. Claire, what would you say from your perspective? And your all's careers are so different. I love to hear all the different uh, perspectives, but. I know. I, I feel like I'm really enjoying listening to y'all. Um, I I was thinking about this and I, I, I kind of agree with you, India, that the, I don't know that. I mean, obviously there are barriers, right? But then I think when you're a leader, you, by by definition, right, you're sort of hacking out a path that other that hasn't been created before right so whether it's an art I mean I think art is a really um, concrete way to think about it that you know you're doing something that hasn't been done before so there's it's not just a job right it's your identity it's like you are creating something that is inside of your head um, and so if you're doing that then you're also exposing yourself to a lot of potential. It's, it's easy for others, whether just unintentionally or, or intentionally to, to make women be quiet, <laughs> to make you feel foolish, to sort of like silence you by criticism or by, you know, other means uh, if necessary. And I, and so sometimes I think, um, that it's it's like a barrier that you can break through but sometimes it feels so difficult to do that it feels so painful when you know you're out there again so exposed um i think like i said i'm not you know there are those there are definitely barriers that are intentionally created by others um and then and then and then sometimes when you when you've been up against one of those, you, the next time you're not so brave as to lead again, because you think, well, I, I don't want to, I don't want that to happen again. I don't want to, I don't want to get so far ahead of, ahead of something that I get, you know, shut back down in some way. I don't know if that makes sense, but I, no, it does. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> No, it does. It definitely does. Yeah, I think it's it, it's interesting how the barriers can be different depending on the situation you're in and, you know, the other people that you're uh, working with. Joy, what would you say um, you've seen from a barrier standpoint? Well, I will say I think that there are barriers, but I believe that we can bust through them. So, I mean, I know that there are there are a lot of systems, systemic systems that have challenged um, and been in place 
for women, for women of color, you know, for, for blacks and browns. And so I think that is, is very important that we, we know that we call them out, that they do exist. Um, I say it's access to, to leadership opportunities. And when we get there, that we're not scrutinized for every little thing. Um, I would say as a woman of color starting a non-for-profit organization and data shows that a lot of times um, to get funding is much harder for us. Um, and that and that and that's not me making that up. That's stuff that has been reported and data shows that. So I just think um there are barriers, um, but we can we can get through them. And I, you know, I had to learn really early, especially in this sector, um, that a no was not a no, it was a not now. So, you know, making sure that all your ducks are in a row. Um, but I do believe that we do have barriers, but there is nothing that we have not overcome and that we can't overcome. I love that. No is not a no, it's a not now. I need to write that down, but I won't do that while I'm moderating this. But that's a great one I need to remember. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a tiny bit. Um, you know, sometimes I think people think it's just easier to donate to an organization. Um, but can you speak a little bit, um, and I'm going to start with, uh, with Joy, a little bit about the importance of getting involved just beyond writing a check. I mean, a lot of times it's just easier, like, I'll just make a donation that'll help that organization. But I know volunteerism is super important. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I would say a check is very important too. <laughs> but yes, volunteerism is a big piece of it because the thing is, I believe to be a true advocate, sometimes it's important to get your boots on that ground. Um, to really understand what's happening in our community. That's so important. Um, so you can be better, a better advocate and a check writer for that organization. Um, you know, and I also believe that people have an access to human capital. Um, you know, you can't, we, we don't get where we are without someone. Someone came and gave us a hand and pushed us up. And the only way for that to happen is for authentic um, opportunities for you to get involved, boots on the ground, um, understanding kind of what the problems are at hand. And that helps you also be a better citizen to the community. Um, so you know that these things really exist. And when you're in meetings and people say it, you're not like, oh my God, I didn't know. Um, you know, it really gives you that opportunity. But I do, I do believe so much in human capital. And a lot of times we know it's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, and so it's just so important, especially in our situation, I say, you know, I, I love to expose my girls um, to women because, you know, for one, they need to see themselves um, in different situations. And the only way for them to do that is to be exposed and to meet people um, and to know that there are possibilities for them. I love that. India, what would you say about um, volunteerism versus just giving back financially, philanthropically? No, definitely. Um, you know, when I was building my advisory board for my company, um, I was looking for the three T's, which is time, talent, and treasure, right? So I know a lot of people are going to be able to write that check, which Joy is right, is duly appreciated, you know, um, but also there are some treasures that people have and possess in terms of their testimonies, their experiences, their voice, their wisdom, all of that, that you, I know we're gonna talk about mentorship, like those are all treasures and talents. And then some people are able to just give time. You know, when you have an event, they're the first one there. When you have a book, they're, they're there to hear your talk. They're there to give that time to support you. And so when I was building my advisory board, I was looking for, those three T's, right? I knew I didn't just need financial help, but I also needed people who had talent and the time to dedicate to my cause um, in terms of what I was trying to do within the community and abroad. So um, those are some of the strategic things I think about in terms of you know, philanthropic uh, initiatives and plans like that, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I also think you as the person donating your time, you get so much out of it as well. I know I find I get, as much out of my husband and I uh, founded a, a homeless ministry and my 11 year old son now is watching for homeless people to help and then it, as we're around in different places and so you know teaching him that and what I get out of it is just as important as what the organization gets or you know the people that you're helping so that's fantastic. Um, Claire what would you say about volunteerism or um, philanth philanthropic uh, donations? Yeah, I well, I feel like I this is a big thing I think about a lot um, and, and try to do a lot. I mean, I think going back to kind of our previous conversation about barriers, 
you know, I think one of the things you do when you get involved in an organization is, is help expand networks. And so, and that's often depending on the nonprofit or, or the organization, you know, being part of something, you can help build networks for people that don't have them. Um, you can help put people together, like maybe, maybe you're working for a, a nonprofit that is trying to increase, you know, literacy, and then you know somebody who's an author, and you know, so especially um, getting involved in that way, I think, is something that we can do beyond. That's like giving our networks to other people, um, and obviously that then turns around and enhances your own life. Um, and I think I've, I don't know, I've I've had a hard time. Um, I like to, I love to volunteer. I sometimes, um, I've realized sometimes that the, the, if I'm not going to be able to really dig in and, and spend my time and energy and, and understand what it is that is needed instead of what it is that I think would be needed, that often it is better to give a check. Now, I'm not, I don't, like I'm not saying that you should always do that, but sometimes it's like my sort of hubris is like, oh, I know what I think this organization could use. Um, but really probably the organization knows, like, you know, <laughs> they know better. And if it's time that I don't have, then I'll write a check. And then if it's something that I'm like, yeah, I really want to listen and understand and do what you need me to do because this is your cause and I believe in it too. Um, then I love to get super involved, but sometimes I feel like I can um, bring my own, what's in my head about what somebody else might need to a situation that's not as helpful. So I've, I've tried to be pretty sensitive to that as I've gotten older. I think that's a great point. It, it is a balance. I mean, the organizations still need our, our philanthropic giving, but um, it is a balance on when's the right time to give versus yeah. volunteer. So I think that's well, a sometimes I'm like, oh, would you, how about casseroles? Cause that's what I have. And it's like, well, if that's not what's needed, then, you know, <laughs> they would rather have a check. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, so I'm going to have one more kind of group question, and then I'm going to come to some individual questions to you guys. But for the last group question, I would say, you know, what's the question you're most tired of hearing on leadership? And what would you say about it so you wouldn't have to answer it again? So, uh, Claire, why don't you start us off on that one? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I think I have three kids and um, I guess people so how do you I mean how do you do it all it's not you know that and I and I and I'm like oh, I don't you know there's a lot of things I don't do that other people are doing you know um so I guess I would I don't know how I would answer in a way that I don't have to answer it again but but that's my answer that I mean I really don't do a lot of things you know it, because it I don't think it's possible um to do a lot of things. So I think I delegate, um, but you know, and then I'm all, I guess the reason I don't like that question too, is I feel like it's putting such a big burden on women to think that mm. you do have to do it all because it's not possible. No one is doing it all. What does that even mean? What is it all? I and mean, there's so much there, <laughs> you know, and I don't think like nobody ever asked my husband that, I mean, <laughs> That's you know, that's so anyway, that's, I mean, I don't, I don't like really hate when people ask me that, but I, I like, I always don't know how to answer it, but. <laughs> no, I think that's good insight. India, do you have any thoughts on kind of what you think is an overused question in leadership and, and how you would talk about it? Uh, I think similar to Claire, the idea of balance, you know, I did a panel yesterday and someone was like, how do you balance it all? And I want to say, you know what, uh, there's, balance doesn't really exist in my world. <laughs> you know, there's no such thing as a balance. I also have two kids, a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And so my days are full of, of wonderful opportunities <laughs> for craziness. So um, I would say that, you know, maybe looking for a harmony, you know, um, something that's fluid, uh, you know, every day is kind of like, what can I get done that day? And if I don't, especially with the pandemic, you know, it's like, if I can get it done, great. If I can't, great. I'll have until tomorrow to take care of it. Right. So I think this idea that 
as women, we're supposed to just balance everything and we're supposed to have it all together, similar to what Claire was saying. And I think um, there's a lot of delegating, but more importantly, I think we just have to show ourselves some grace mm -hmm. and say, you know what? It's okay. And I, every day I have to show myself grace. <laughs> just say, you know what? I'm pausing right now. And that's okay. I'll take care of it tomorrow. You know, so, or not. so yeah, I just need no one ask me that question. How do you balance it? I'm like, listen, I think we just gotta take that word out of our vocabulary for now on. Yeah. Joy, so what about you? What do you think is kind of overused from a leadership kind of perspective? Um I would probably I would I would piggyback off what these two uh, ladies have also said. I mean, I have a one year old as well. And I think, um, you know, I've had to learn very quickly to just say, yeah, that's probably not going to get done today. And that's OK. And also giving my husband a chore list of <laughs> things to do. Um, but I would say I just think the thing is really in Women's History Month, like just this whole idea of women just being questioned for their leadership in general. A lot of questions that were asked, men are never asked. Um, as Terry has pointed out. And I just think, um, so, I mean, there's many questions I can go on, um, and especially with girls in leadership. A lot of times people say, well, do girls need that? Yes, they do. When you look at data and how often um, girls are being challenged at a, a much higher rate than their counterparts. So yes, um, there's, there's many questions, but I will piggyback off these ladies and say, definitely when it comes to family, um, figuring out, and the grace is a big one, just to, to say, you know what, it's not going to get done today, and that's okay. Um, I did my best um, in remembering that day to day, especially as we continue to navigate in this pandemic. Yes, definitely. So Claire, I'm going to come to you with an individual question. So we talk here a lot about work-life balance, and I'm not sure there is one. I, I talk about work-life and integration. I learned that from um, my colleague, Shay Mustafa. She talks about how, it's in, how you integrate those two things. But how, would, how do you make sure that you take care of yourself? Because, you know, if we're not at our best, we can't make sure our people and our teams are at their best. So how do you make sure you take care of yourself? Oh, that's a hard question. <laughs> um, I don't, yeah, I don't feel like I, I don't feel like I'm a good balanced person. I really like enjoy being kind of all into something. And I, you know, I've, I can tend to get pretty like focused and, and, um, pigeonholed and like, I could work 80 hours a week if I didn't have kids and I could spend 80 hours a week with my kids, if I didn't have work. So I, so hence, I always feel like I'm dropping the ball somewhere. Um, I don't know. I mean, I try, you know, I try to exercise. I try to, I try to make myself do things that are, you know, balance-ish. Um, but like, I don't, I'm not very good at self-care. I'm just not, um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I will say, it's hard, like, isn't it? I know, it I'm is. sorry, this is just not, it's like, but that's, that's why it's such a, an illusion, because I just don't think it exists. But, you know, like, I try to remind other people. So like, back to the question, like, how do, how do you do it all? Like, as a woman, you know, the reason that I started my business, when I was in the first place, the dinners on the porch, not even the restaurant, was I had had, you know, my, I was a stay in mom I was totally totally 100% into that at the time and then and I had the boys were kind of they were growing up so I had a little more time and I started cooking and I was really enjoying that and then when we adopted our daughter she was already 16 months old so she, we got home and she was all over the house I couldn't even like boil a pot of spaghetti and so I was like this is a nightmare you know like how is anyone putting dinner on the table so the whole reason I started the business was because I was like I can't do this I bet no one else can either I bet that working or just not I mean I wasn't working you know outside the home so I was like I bet I bet other people could use dinner at their house. <laughs> so I just feel like just accepting your limitations, buying takeout, you know, uh, like mail order clothes if you don't have time to go to the grocery store. I just try to, again, like India said, like give myself grace with things that are just not fitting in and take those and stop, stop feeling guilty about it. So I, I work on that. 
Awesome. Thank you. So Joy, um, I want to ask you kind of what do you, do you ever have kind of toxic thoughts you have to kind of talk yourself out of and what self-talk kind of grounds you when you get in that, in that mode? Um, any thoughts? Yeah, so I'll be, and I'm always very transparent. My husband's like, oh God, here she go. Um, I think, you know, I think one thing I think is we all have toxic thoughts. Like, I mean, um, a lot of it, I would say, and I remember I when I first started lead, there was one question people would ask me and it would just drive me insane. And it would always be men that would say, well, what's your background? And like, what does that matter if I was the janitor? It, that, that, that doesn't matter. Or just people, you know, people and a lot of things will creep into your mind. So you just have to be in control of that. I would say what has really helped me is meditation. Um, I think that's very important. I try to ground myself uh, before my thoughts get crazy and, and run and rampant. Um, I, I would also say prayer is a big one for me. Um, and then um, just finding time to get out and get some fresh air. That is so important for us to really get some fresh air. And so, you know, I do try to find time to get outside with my son. Um, and before I would use, you know, when I was in a much better shape, um, I would run because that was my way to, you know, relieve things. But I would say um, also find you a good quote. Um, when those, to those toxic things come in your mind, you have to have something available immediately to counter um, those thoughts. If not, they can take control over everything and shift your whole day, your mindset. So, you know, I always tell people have one thing or something that you can go to um, that will help center you um, when those thoughts creep in your mind, because we all have that other person um, that we need to tell that you need to go sit down because that's not what, what's happening right now. Um, and so I just say um, definitely meditation, prayer, and finding you something um, that will help you stay grounded or retract those those thoughts that shouldn't be in your mind anyway. I love that. Yeah, with COVID, I know we're on virtual meetings. Everybody's on virtual meetings all day long, right? And you're right. Just getting up and walking down the street, getting some fresh air. It's amazing how it can clear your mind out and help you kind of move past it. So I, I love those ideas. Thank you. So, Indy, I want to ask you, kind of, how would you recommend um, people foster an environment of diverse thought and action? So what's something people can do in their workplaces, their homes, anywhere that could help foster that? Uh, well, you know, um, so in my workshop, we really focus on, so the, the mustard seed, right? Is like, we talk about mustard seeds of faith. Uh, the mustard seed is like supposedly the smallest seed, one of the smallest seeds in the world, right? And so when I'm doing my workshops or even my keynotes, I tell people that I want you to focus on those mustard seeds of similarity. Sometimes it's just the smallest thing that can connect us to make us feel like we can relate to someone. I just so happen to be a woman. I just so happen to be black, but I'm human. And because I'm human, there are things that, that we have insecurities and fears and frustrations and doubt. All of those things exist because we are human, but you have to see me as human first to respect me as a colleague, to respect me as a professional, to see me as a friend. So you have to see me as human. And so for me, thinking about those mustard seeds of similarity, the ways in which we can connect with one another, I would say I challenge you, my audience, to think about those. You know, I've photographed um, Klansmen before. I photographed Crips and Bloods in, in different areas. I photographed all these different neighborhoods and communities. And you would say, oh my gosh, like someone from the Klan allowed you to take their picture? Yes, because they wanted to be seen and heard. It had nothing to do with my race. They, they knew I was there for them, regardless, to tell their story. So with that being said, as a photographer who's going out in the world documenting the lives of people who normally were afraid of, I found in my own practice that it's important that we look for those human characteristics. And if we can find those, then we can build upon those. You know, we all were mothers, right? Or I don't know, we're all tired right now. <laughs> There's certain things that can just bring us together in ways that we've never imagined. And so I would just challenge my audience, you know, if you find yourself in a situation of discomfort, that's okay, right? We have to be comfortable being uncomfortable, most importantly, looking for opportunities where we can see ourselves and others, even if we're divided, even if we're different. I think right now, more so than ever, it's important to have that in the back of your mind when you're in certain conversations, um, that maybe there's a possibility we can connect, yeah. 
Wow, India, that's so powerful. I love that. <laughs> Mustard seed of similarity. I've got another one. I'm going to write these on my whiteboard and have them for when I'm having one of those days I need to get a positive thought in my head. So this is phenomenal. Uh, well, we're actually going to um, shift. So um, we've got um, breakout sessions. So we still have a lot more to go. And I'm so excited to hear more uh, in the breakouts. But I want to thank everyone who attended today's panel discussion. And a special thanks to our panelists for their time today in this part of the venue. Um, and we're going to transition now to the breakout portion of the event. Um, so in um, the invitation, there was a breakout session link for different breakout sessions. So if you can choose the breakout session to attend from those links, I think Brittany may actually post them. Yep, she posted them in the chat box as well. Um, and there are breakout sessions for each speaker. And there's also a general networking session um, and you can navigate between them if you wish, or you can spend the next 30 minutes in one session. Um, but our event will end with the breakout sessions closing at 630. I hope you've enjoyed your evening thus far. I, I know I have, and uh, we'll see you in the breakout sessions. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.